Thank you. Uh, my name's Paul. I work for Data61 CSIRO, and I need to get a bit better at coming up with snappy titles for my presentations. Um, quick content warning, the concepts and assumptions underlying this talk may be confronting for flat earthers. So, um, yeah. Whoops. I live in Canberra, and this is the view from my balcony at the back of my house. Uh, that little line of green of trees you can see curving off in the distance is the Murrumbidgee River. Uh, my wife and I saw this view on a real estate website and realised we could afford it. And three months later, we'd uprooted ourselves from our lives in Melbourne and uh, we're living in Canberra with new jobs and kids in new schools and so forth. Uh, I really appreciate a good view. Which is why I always request a window seat on airplanes. Uh, that's the uh, Port Hills coming into um, Christchurch on the weekend. Um, you can see, well, you've re all read the, heard the title of this talk, so you know where this is heading. Um, I was really excited to get the chance to work on Earth observation satellite imagery and take my views to the next level. Because we are living in a golden age of Earth observation satellites right now, we really are. Uh, since technology is improving rapidly, multiple government space agencies and private companies around the world are maintaining Earth observation programs. New satellites are being launched regularly and the data from the old ones keeps on flying in. Satellites image the ground below them. So the coverage they have of the Earth is a function of their ground path, which is a function of their orbit around the Earth. Um, geostationary orbits uh, are high altitude orbits so that the uh, satellite rotates around the Earth at the same speed that the Earth itself rotates on its axis so that you're always more or less above the same point on the equator. The ground path basically inscribes a pattern around a point on the equator. It can be a circle, it can be a sort of figure eight, or even be almost square. Um, geostationary orbits are great for things like weather satellites. Um, you, they have very high altitudes, so you've got, you can image quite a lot of area on the ground at once, um, but you, your, ground, your ground resolution is not that great because you are much further away. If you want to capture high resolution imagery of the entire surface of the Earth, you need something like a circumpolar orbit, which is where the satellite is orbiting over both the poles and the uh, Earth sort of rotates slowly underneath you. So you gradually build up these series of paths across the uh, north and south across the Earth. And over the period of a, of a week or two, they start to overlap and cover the entire Earth. The overlap is much higher at the poles and quite small at the equator because of the shape of the Earth. Um, the data that comes directly down from the satellite is just raw pixel data. It's um, not really terribly useful. Um, the first level of processing we need to do to get it into a useful form is to georectify it, uh, add, um, work out the latitude and longitude for, of each pixel. Uh, do a bit of um, reprojection to correct for the curvature of the Earth. Um, low, uh, a satellite in a circumpolar orbit in, in low Earth orbit uh, is only um, imaging a fairly narrow uh, range of the Earth, but we still have to correct for the curvature of the edges. Um, that's level one data. It's essentially a measure of surface radiance. So it's, a, it's the amount of light coming from a point on the Earth up to the sensor. Uh, things are much nicer once we, when we take things to the next level. We start to correct for things like the solar, the angle that the sun is hitting the Earth at, the angle that the satellite is observing the ground at, atmospheric conditions, terrain angle, and so forth. And once we sort of factor that in, uh, us uh, data processing people call that level two data. The scientists tend to call it analysis ready data because that's, uh, that's what they care about. There are a bunch of satellites in orbit, as I was uh, said in the introduction. Um, but most of them are, you've got to pay to get access to, and some of them are quite expensive. So the satellites that we in this room, and, and certainly us on this project, are most interested in are the ones with the free and open data policy. And the two key satellites are uh, Landsat 8 from NASA and Sentinel-2 from the European Space Agency. Uh, Sentinel-2 is the superior platform by most measures. Uh, it has a 10 metre resolution compared to a 25, 30 metre resolution for Landsat. Um, some of the commercial satellites have resolutions down to 30 centimetres, uh, and you can take your own guess as to what the resolution on the uh, top secret military satellites is. 
Um, Sentinel-2 has uh, 13 spectral bands, seven visible, six infrared, compared to about nine on, um, on Landsat. Uh, Sentinel-2 covers the entire Earth over a 10-day cycle. Or actually, because, because there's two satellites, the Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B, they're in staggered orbits. If you combine the data from both, it's actually a five-day cycle, whereas Landsat-8 has a 16-day cycle. Uh, you can get down, down to eight by combining that with data from Landsat-7, uh, which is still uh, operating, but uh, Landsat-7 isn't exactly the same as Landsat 8, unlike Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2, uh, 2A and 2B, which are identical. Uh, Landsat 7 has, I think, one less spectral band, and it also has an optical flaw that um, developed after about four years after launch. And if you look at, at uh, Landsat 7 data, you'll see these uh, sort of horizontal gaps, these little strips through the data, which is uh, a result of this mechanical failure on, on, on the satellite. Um, so why bother with Landsat at all? Well, it's because going back through previous to seven, even Landsat's four and, and even uh, Landsat five and even four, there is no Landsat six, by the way. Um, we have this huge long baseline of, of data. We have data going right back to I mean, 992, really. Landsat four didn't, wasn't capturing data continuously. It was, they turned it on and off when they were interested in things. Uh, but certainly from Landsat five on, we had this continuous coverage of data right through. So if you want to do these long baseline comparisons, of data, then Landsat 8 is your platform, or Landsat is your platform. If you're uh, only really looking at recent data, then you're probably going to be focusing on Sentinel-2. Uh, brief shout out to the people paying for this work, uh, Digital Earth Australia. It's a platform operated by Geoscience Australia to manage Earth observation data for Australia, for the scientific community and, and the general public. Uh, they use the uh, NCI, which is the Government uh, Research uh, High Performance Computing Cluster, and also uh, AWS, uh, Cloud Computing. Um, it's one of the few science programs whose funding allocation was actually increased in the last federal budget. Um, so what do they come to us with? They have this thing called the Open Data Cube, which is an open source platform for measuring Earth observation data, for managing Earth observation data. Uh, it's under the Apache 2 license. Uh, it was originally the Australian Geoscience Data Cube, so it was actually developed by GA, um, but it's now managed by an international consortium, which as well as, as, as GA and CSIRO also includes uh, international bodies, NASA, European Space Agency, and a number of other companies around the world interested in uh, open processing of, or in, in open satellite data. Um, it's written in Python 3. It's based on X-Array, which is not the X-Array in the Linux kernel, which you might have heard about in other talks this week. Um, if you're familiar with Pandas, the Pandas library, anyone know Pandas? Uh, some of you? Um, X-Array basically does for NumPy what Pandas does for regular Python arrays. So it lets you do some nice uh, array manipulation, but with that uh, added um, performance punch of, of NumPy. Um, the metadata is stored in a Postgres database, and the actual satellite data is, is um, read from wherever, wherever it happens to be. Uh, the data cube knows from ingestion uh, whether it's stored locally or in a network repository, and it will just pull it in. From the, for the point of view of the user writing algorithms, it's completely uh, transparent. You just say, I want this data, and it grabs the data for you from wherever it is. There is a uh, graphical interface uh, maintained by CEOS, which is the Committee for Earth Observation Satellites. Um, but the GUI is not as mature or actively developed as the core library, uh, but it's a, it's a reasonable way to get started. Uh, until recently, the ADC lacked a robust open source cloud publishing platform. Why do you want that? Uh, you might be familiar, Australians certainly might be familiar with uh, National Map. Uh, nationalmap.gov.au. If you're not, please do check it out. It's an amazing uh, bit of software. It's built on Terrier.js, which is an open source web-based mapping framework for visualizing geospatial data, uh, developed again by uh, Data61. Um, National Map aims to publish all Australian government open data that can be mapped. Um, it, it isn't totally complete, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. There's a huge amount of data there, and I, I strongly encourage you to have an have a explore of that if you're not familiar with it. Um, some Digital Earth Australia data was already being published directly to National Map um, from the NCI, 
but there was a need for the additional flexibility and scalability of cloud deployment, as well as I mentioned before, the strategic desire for um, an open source solution within the, the Open Data Cube um, ecosystem. So, what do we do? First key to the puzzle is COG support in DataCube Core. Now, COGs are cloud-optimised GeoTIFFs. The TIFF format, which I'm sure you've all heard of, it's a high-level uh, file container, uh, um, container format. It has a huge amount of flexibility in how the data is laid out inside. In general, if there's a little bit of data you want in a TIFF file, you've got to download the whole thing and parse it and figure out where the data is. COGS constrain that layout quite a lot so that a COG-aware client can figure out exactly where the data it wants is within the file, and it can do an HTB get range request to pull that in, uh, which means that if you've got those COGS sitting on something like S3, you can get really excellent performance just pulling out those little bits of the, of the file that you want. That work was done by DEA's internal development team. Hi, guys. I'm sure you're watching at home. Um, my bit, though, or the bit that we, they came to Data61 for, is uh, what we now call DataCube OWS. OWS is just Open Web Services. It's a bit of a dull name, but we did want to badge it as being part of the DataCube uh, project rather than its own thing. Uh, it's an open source, lightweight web application server. Uh, it's written in Python 3, so it just sits, it integrates directly with the Open Data Cube. Um, and it publishes standard OGC geospatial web service protocols, all those lovely acronyms starting with W up there. Uh, if you're not familiar with those, don't worry, I'll explain them in a minute. Uh, again, the metadata is stored in the database, but the, the data itself in, in the cloud can be stored in S3 and, and, and pulled down as needed and reprojected on the fly. Uh, this means that there's a whole lot of uh, calculations that we can do dynamically uh, at when, uh, as the data is being requested that just wouldn't be possible in a more traditional architecture. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about those acronyms. Uh, WMS is the OGC Web Map Service. It's uh, general purpose, good for general purpose web apps. Uh, you sort of pass in a bounding, bounding box coordinates and a coordinate reference system, a layer, a style, image size and pixels, that sort of thing, and you get back a map tile of your requested area in the requested format. Um, just returns standard computer RGB images, JPEGs, GIFs, PNGs. We tend to prefer PNGs because PNGs uh, support uh, transparency. Um, has this concept of styles which are different ways of rendering the underlying data into a 24-bit RGB image. Um, I th the original intention, if you read the spec, is it's clearly talking about vector data. So if you had vector map, uh, you know, street map data or something, you could have a style where the freeways were red and a style, style where the freeways were green or whatever. But obviously, when you're dealing with multi-band satellite imagery, uh, th th that uh, you can do much more exciting things with that concept. Uh, there's also a get feature info method, which lets you uh, get structured data for individual pixels within the image. Um, it's fairly clearly specified. Uh, for an OGV, OGC standard, it's, it's almost readable. Um, most clients are fairly predictable, uh, with a few exceptions that we'll get back to in a minute. Um, and it's certainly well supported by Terrier.js, which is our main target client. Uh, all these protocols I'm going to talk about today have issues around sparse data. They define a uh, spatial extent, which is basically a bounding box, and a temporal extent, which is a list of dates. And it's kind of assumed by the protocol that if you have data for a particular point, you've got data for that point for all the dates, and, and vice versa. This is not true for satellite data. On day one, we might have data for this strip. On day two, we'll have data for this strip. On day three, we'll have data for this strip. And it's not always easy working out when the, well, you can't tell immediately from the, from the actual service where the next data for that point is, what, 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 when the next data for that point is, rather. Um, so, yeah, this is an ongoing problem. The current status of our WMS implementation is that we support version 1.3 very well. It's the most recent version of the protocol. Um, works well with most clients, uh, there were some caveats we'll get to in a minute. Um, 
And we use those styles for band mapping. Um, there's a great example here. So this is an island off the coast of uh, Queensland. Uh, there's a bushfire burning on it on that day. Um, in the RGB image at the top, so that's just the standard visible bands, all you can see is the smoke from the fire. But when you throw in a few of the infrared bands, you can really clearly see the unburnt vegetation to the burnt out vegetation. You can even see the active fire front in red there. Um, and you can see that right through the smoke and through the clouds because it's infrared, it's shining straight through. Uh, it's really good for that. We have other styles for other purposes, um, for looking at, uh, at the strength of vegetation growth, um, the amount of chlorophyll in the water. We can image um, algal blooms in lakes and rivers, for example. <clears throat> we can do on-the-fly solar angle correction. This means that if we can't store our own, or if, you know, if you're using this and you don't have the money to throw huge amounts of level two data in S3, you can simply index the level one data that USGS publishes in a public S3 bucket and you can serve directly off that and get reasonable performance. It's not as nice as actual work, working with real level two data, but you can get pretty close. Um, we have some, a few hacks to help with that sparse data issue. Um, when you zoom right out, you, if, you, if you can just view the whole of Australia, for example, that's a huge amount of data to be pulling into one image or you know, to, in, into one, even one tile. Um, so beyond a certain point, we just show um, like grey polygons where the, showing where the data is. They are really easy and quick to render because we only need to read the metadata. We don't need to pull the satellite data in at all. Um, and also with the get feature info, we obviously return things, obvious things like the raw band data for all the spectral bands for that pixel. But we also tell you all the other dates for which we have data for that point. So and that, that, that there are sort of workarounds for that sparse data issue. Um, WMTS is the web map tiling service. It's a simplified version of WMS in that you have fixed tile size and zoom levels. So instead of requesting a bounding box and coordinate and pixel, pixel uh, coordinate uh, image pixel size, you say I want this zoom level and this tile number, and you get it. Uh, it's often used with, uh, for apps that want to do um, a lot of pre-calculation or, um, or, or rely on caching for performance. We don't. The reason we implement WMTS is because there are some clients that pathologically ignore the advertised max width and max height limits. You say, no bigger than 512 by 512 tiles, thank you very much. And they say, give me a 1920 by 1080 image tile, please. And you say, no, and they get really upset for some reason. It's very confusing. Um, so yeah, we implemented that for them. Um, client support's usually pretty good, as long as you stick to Google style tile size and zoom levels. That's a sort of de facto industry standard. It's not part of the official standard. Um, Terry support, Terry JS support is actually a bit flaky. For Terry JS, we prefer WMS. Uh, WMTS, as I said, is really for those uh, misbehaving clients, which includes some very expensive commercial clients, I might add. And some open source ones, has to be said too. Um, current WMTS uh, status, we support version one, which is the latest and only version. Uh, it works by converting the WMTS request into a WMS request. So all those features I talked about for WMS, you just get out of the box with WMTS as well. Um, we haven't done a huge amount of cross-client testing, uh, but we're pretty confident in, it, in its stability just because it is so simple and 98% of the code path is the WMS stuff, which is well tested. So The whole thing, uh, WMTS was implemented at the community day at the Phos4G Oceania conference in Melbourne in November. Um, I threw it together in about five hours, of which four was reading the spec. Uh, where things get interesting, though, is here with WCS, the web coverage service. This is not a general purpose protocol. This is designed for scientists and data specialists. Um, it returns uh, the raw data. You're getting, you're getting the full 12-bit um, dynamic range per channel. You can request which of the bands, available bands you want. 
Uh, it's returned in a rich container format like GeoTIFF or NetCDF. Um, the specification is a nightmare to read. It's very complicated, it's um, it, very difficult to read. And uh, unsurprisingly, there's a fair bit of divergence in client behavior. Um, I can really see when you're testing it this, you can say, oh, these guys are honoring this part of the spec and ignoring this part, and these guys ignore this part and honor this part. And sometimes they are both you know, respecting the same part of the spec, but they interpret it slightly differently. There's a lot, a lot of fun and games there. Um, still a work in progress. Uh, we support version one. Uh, there are more recent versions available, and they do define behavior a bit more strictly and a bit more, um, a bit less ambiguously. Uh, the problem is, or the reason we, we chose to start with version one is that version one is specified in one document. You can download the WCS one spec, you can read it from front to back, and you get a pretty good idea of what's meant to be happening. WCS2 is spread over about eight documents that all cross-reference each other. Um, it's, yeah, very confusing if you're coming into this from the first time. Um, our implementation works well with the experimental Terrier JS client, which is unsurprising because they're basically written for each other. Um, it does also work reasonably with QGIS, uh, which is an open source package, and ArcGIS, which is not. Um, I don't think we can get it working much better without either writing a, a specialist plugins for those, uh, for those clients, or um, possibly if moving to WCS2 will address some of the issues that are outstanding. Uh, we support NetCDF and GeoTIFF. Oh, I'm racing ahead. It's good with lots of time for a uh, demo at the end. Um, so next steps. Um, WPS is another protocol. It stands for Web Processing Service. Um, it allows you to do on-the-fly on data processing for, for, for clients. Um, every time we have a strategy meeting, we talk about it. We've got all sorts of potential applications for it, but it always ends up on the bottom of the priority list. Um, we may get to it one day, who knows. <laughs> um, we'd like to get a slightly better integration with DataCube Core. There are some metadata elements that we need in order to implement the service that we can't efficiently get out of the DataCube which means that we sort of have to do some pre-processing of, 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 of the data. We need to sort of scan through the whole data set and, and build this metadata up separately. It would be great if we could do that within the data cube when we do the initial data ingestion rather than having to do it separately. Um, we would like to have a look at the most recent WCS versions, including WCS2EO, which is an Earth observation extension. Um, and that's really, again, about dealing with these sparse data issues that I mentioned. Um, it, but it doesn't really fit in well with the way we've structured things. So, um, and it certainly doesn't address the issues in, in, in the other protocols, in WMS and WMTS. The documentation and test suite do need work. Uh, they're not awful, but they're not great either. Um, <clears throat> And obviously more deployments and more data, and we really need to get our teeth into this sparse data problem. Uh, in particular because uh, just last week before I came here, uh, a project was approved with, with GA to, for us to help them uh, digitize and publish their extensive aerial photography library, uh, which goes right back to the 1920s. Um, very exciting data set to get, get our teeth into but uh, it's even more sparse than the satellite data. So we're really gonna have to um, figure this out. Uh, and a demo. So let's have a little look. I'll move over here so I can see what I'm doing. No, where's my mouse cursor? Ah, oh, there I am, okay. So let's uh, maximize that. No. Okay, so this is a uh, national map, um, which is an instance of, of Terry JS, as I discussed. So we can grab this satellite imagery. We'll go straight down to the Sentinel-2 near real time. The um, issue with all this, of course, is, is the amount of space it takes up on S3 and the cost thereof. Um, so there's near, real, there's near real time 
ones basically show the last 90 days of data um, and usually go up to about to yesterday. Uh, so, yep, 23rd of January, that would be, um, that would be yesterday. So you can see there the, 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 the grey polygons where we have data and when we zoom in they fairly quickly start to populate with imagery. Um, so again that is um, RGB, I can switch to, uh, so that's that false colour one we were talking about before that highlights the um, bushfires if we had any but I, you know, I didn't, didn't look for some beforehand. But we'll pull back out again. Um, we can pick the date we're interested in. Uh, so we can go back to you know, a few days ago or whatever. Actually, I'll step through them just so you can see the, the, the way those strips march across. Um, so let's see, we go got some per Perth. Let's see. I'll go back to red, green, blue. I mean, the other issue with this, of course, too, is that um, satellites can't see through clouds. And oh, this is a nice clear day, as I, that was by, by pure fluke. Often you'll, uh, you'll, you'll be, oh, there's something exciting happened that you think might see in the satellite. You go, oh yes, I've got coverage on that day, and you go and have a look, and it's just pure white clouds. Um, there's nothing I can do about that, I'm sorry. But uh, I'll just zoom right in so you can see what the resolution on this is. That's about the limit of it. If I start going much further than that, it starts to get blocky. But um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's satellite image, for freely available satellite imagery, it, it's, it's pretty good. Um, as well as that near real time, we've also got um, the uh, Landsat Geomedian. With, so this is uh, a sort of annual average for the whole country. So if I add that there, I'll get rid of the Sentinel ones. So that covers the entire thing. If I now zoom, I'll, we'll, we'll grab Sydney. If I zoom into Sydney there. So that is Sydney, this is Sydney, Sydney 2017. It's gonna, it was gonna render, come on. There we go. Um, but now what I can do also is uh, split screen and I can add, say, uh, Landsat 5 and then I'll put one on the left, one on the right and then Landsat 5 I will take right back <laughs> to 1988. So now what we are looking at is on one side we have, um, so you can see that's, that's the development of, of Sydney from 1988 to, to last year. Um, all sorts of fun and games to be had with that. Uh, I've got a few more minutes so I'll just quickly show you one more that this is the mo this is hidden away but it is, whoops. Ah, oh, can't get it, terrain, terrain, no, it's not terrain, what's it under? Um, I found it before. Oh, it's under elevation, I think, maybe, oops, that's bad. Elevation, is it? No, that's not it. Uh, Multisculptor is this one, this is a beauty. So this is far and away the most weird and psychedelic imagery we have. Um, it's basically a terrain map um, and just to give you a feel for what's actually happening there, um, I can, because this is all 3D because it's interior JS, you can see there what's actually happening. So I think we might call that a day and I am open, if I can get my thing back, I will open for, uh, questions. <laughs>
My question is really simple. Will you see bushfires in Tassie for the last few days? Um, yes, uh, if, 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 if the satellite was overhead. So I can... Yeah, so yeah, uh, I haven't looked at the bushfires in Tassie. Um, I've certainly had a good look at the ones in Queensland earlier in the year, uh, and we've certainly got good, some good views of them. Just curious about this issue with sparse data. Uh, WCS, I presume, came later than the others. Is the standards? Um, WCS, yeah, WCS version one would have been after WMS mm. version one, but uh, it's been more aggressively developed as well okay. because it, because it was such a complex protocol, and they realised what was wrong with the first version. I think. But uh, yeah, I'm not an expert in that yet because I haven't got my head around vision two yet. <laughs> I'd have thought that it's not just relevant for Earth observation. There'd be all sorts of other situations where there'd be data there or not. Yes, yes, um, yeah, that's right. Uh, we've, we've talked a bit about possible approaches. Uh, maybe new. Uh, we might need a whole new protocol. We might need extensions to existing protocols, or possibly even just better ways of getting the existing photo protocols to interact with each other, but yeah. I wonder if you support uh, distribution of data to users. Uh, for example, if someone wants to download a month of data for post-processing offline, is it possible on your so platform? That's, that's what you would use WCS for. OK. Um, so you would just, and yeah, you maybe would a follow-up question. You request uh, the, the data you need, and you, you get the data you, know, you asked for in, in the raw format. Yeah, uh, maybe a follow-up question. Do you think uh, that using the like late, latest um, kind of technology, like using IPFS, the interplanetary file system, or uh, that protocol for downloading our system data, do you think these protocols are viable? I'm not sure if, you, if you're aware of them. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not uh, across those particular protocols. Um, we, are, we certainly want to keep this, um, everything sort of open and standards-based. Um, GA is a member of the OGC, so we, we, we do sort of favour the OGC protocols for that reason. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, um, are you talk, so we, we, are you talking about in terms of, of, of communication between the data cube and the, the data, or between the, on this the, the web service layer? Uh, so traditionally. Yeah, right, okay. It's most common and uh, it's quite cumbersome. And we started newer file systems, like major file systems, starting to use maybe this uh, download in a more automated way. Yeah, so I mean, the way, the way well, I mean, once, once we've got it and processed into level two format, as I say, we're using um, COGS on S3, which gives us huge performance. Um, the, that getting that data initially is certainly the slow part of the data processing chain. Um, it is, it is it's about 13, 14 hour turnaround. It'd be, um, be good to get that a little bit shorter. I know people who, you know, I've spoken to people from New South Wales, from uh, Western Australian Land Agency, for example, who um, get a, uh, increase the speed of their Sentinel-2 pipeline by actually having their own ground stations and downloading the data from the satellite themselves. <laughs> Any more questions at all? In that case, I'd ask all to show your appreciation to Paul. Thank you.